La siguiente conferencia eh, la va a realizar Cristina Zampayo. Cristina Zampayo creo que ya la mayoría de ustedes la conocen, eh, es, la, es la jefe médica de CHDI y Cristina fue educada como médico y como eh, doctora en, en Lisboa, sigue vinculada a muchas actividades académicas en Lisboa eh, y básicamente en CHDI tiene tiene bajo su supervisión eh, la gran mayoría de, de actividades clínicas y, la, y, y el hecho de que EnrollHD exista y pueda hacer presencia en Latinoamérica se debe en gran parte a su gestión. Entonces, Cristina. Thank you, Roger. Um, buenas tardes. Uh, I, I'll, I'm going to speak in English because my Spanish is not suficiently good, but um, I understand well Spanish, so if in the end anybody has any questions, you are free to make them in Spanish. Um, what I'm going to speak about is mostly about a new method. Okay. Okay. It's good? Okay, so I, I'm going to speak about a new system of a, a new language to speak about Huntington's disease, but in the context of research. It's very likely that in the future, after a lot of research is done, this new language will be applied, maybe with some modifications, to the clinical practice. But at the moment, this is a system that is intended to be used in clinical research. And it is extremely important, I'm going to explain wh why it is so important, that uh, what we now call the Huntington's Disease Integrated Staging System, and uh, a couple of my colleagues already mentioned it during their talks, the, the process that we took to develop this system and the impact that this system will have in the research in general. Just to say that uh, we are now developing a, a second version of Enroll HD that already we spoke a lot about Enroll HD. So we are planning what we called Enroll HD 2.0. And in that new protocol that will be rolled out in the coming years, the selection of participants for Enroll and the classification of participants in Enroll will follow uh, this system. So let's see if I do better than Bernard with this thing. I don't. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, first of all, probably I will not have a lot of time to go over all the details. And so just to say, this is the paper where this system has been uh, explained and, uh, uh, and it is published in detail. I'm the senior author of this paper, so you can, you can look for it. It is very, fine to, uh, very easy to find. It's published in Lancet Neurology. Okay? Haha! -ha. Now it was a bit better. Um, so I'm organizing this um, talk around a list of questions. These first three questions are generic questions. They are not immediately related with the new staging system, and it's just to, let's say, warm up your ideas about how and why we need a staging system for Huntington's disease. And then we will speak about the questions that are related directly with the um, HDISS, with the new staging system. So first of all, starting by a very, very easy question, that, that all of us think that they know how to answer, but sometimes is not so straightforward. So, what is clinical research? So, I believe all of you know or have an idea or concept of what research is. But clinical research is all studies that are done in people, human beings, with the intent to advance medical knowledge. And this encompasses a huge variety of, of studies, from epidemiology, psychology, 
fewer clinical studies, so there is a, a huge variety. There is a technical, uh, let's say, a more technical concept associated with, the, with clinical research, which is even if you are doing studies just with uh, samples, so blood samples or uh, uh, liquor samples or other type of samples, whenever you are able to connect the dots between an individual and that sample, it is still clinical research. Only if you go to a bank and you take samples that you cannot connect back, then the, the, there is a, it's not anymore strictly clinical research. So clinical research is done with people, and these people might be healthy volunteers, people without any disease, or people with a specific disease. And in this case, we are interested in Huntington's disease. So the first most important thing to do, you might think, oh, it's so easy. I'm going to show you that it isn't. The most important thing to do is to say, who is normal, who does not have the disease, and who does have the disease. And so to make a very clear separation between the two groups is essential for clinical research. We need to know what we are studying, but sometimes it's not so easy to do. So, what is a, medic, uh, what is a medical staging system? Uh, I'm going to show you, you are probably much more familiar with the cancer staging system. So when people have cancer, uh, it's, n it's common to say, oh, it's, a, it's a early cancer is stage, is stage zero. I'll come back to that. So usually what in medicine people do is they try to organize the population of, of patients in groups that are similar. And this is very useful if the groups that one group among everybody that has the disease, one group has a similar, similar characteristics, so when we see them in, in the clinical context, in the visit, we, we find out the same characteristics, they have the same type of problems. Also, we can say if somebody is in a given, in a particular stage, we can have a good understanding of what is the prognosis of that person, what is going to happen in the next coming years. And for the health systems, it's very important to know that people that are in a particular stage will require a, a particular level of care that costs also a certain amount. So having this uh, organization in, a, in staging systems is extremely important for the development of new uh, drugs, new technologies, and for I have to say, for the governments to make decisions about how they, they support them, how they reimburse them. So it's, it's very important. So just for you to recap, uh, in medicine there are several staging systems for each, not every disease has a staging system, but uh, in Alzheimer's there is a a very well-known staging system that is very similar to the one I'm going to show you for Huntington's, but the concept of staging is very common in cancer, as I said, and this, this example here is for breast cancer, and people can, can have, if they have breast cancer, they might have very early disease that is called stage zero that can be treated with the intent of, cu of, of being cura curative. If people have stage one, there is already some spread, but it's still very localized. Then there is stage two, and of course it goes up to the point of uh, the very advanced cases of cancer where there are metastases all over the body. So, this system is, I just want to n make a note here because this is important. For example, for stage two, the lesion, the, the cancer lesion, this is breast cancer, needs to be 50 millimeters or less. So there is a, a very clear landmark even in this staging system. 
Okay, so the, uh, the, the question that you might ask is, why on hell do we need a staging system in Huntington's disease? What about uh, everything we have been doing so far? Okay, so the most important issue is about uh, the concept of clinical motor diagnosis. You have been used to the idea that a, a person that suffers from Huntington's disease is diagnosed with the clinical part of the disease when they have a certain constellation of signs. And this clinical motor diagnosis, as you have seen already for, by many of the lectures before me, happens very late in the, in, the, in the development of the disease. And obviously, it's very clear for all of you that the disease don't, don't start then. Uh, many, there are many, many things that happened before, many years before, the so-called clinical motor diagnosis. Now, you have to do um, a step back in history because before there was the ability to detect the gene, and we already also spoke a lot about the contribution that the Latin American communities, particularly Venezuelan community, gave to the discovery of the gene. But before the gene was known, and this was published in 1993, there was the, it was impossible to diagnose the disease without clinical observation. So the only way that, that existed to say this person suffers from Huntington's disease was to observe the clinical manifestations. But nowadays, technology has evolved. Now we have an easy-to-do genetic test. And so uh, uh, we don't rely so much on this. And so one of the problems there is with the idea that the disease is diagnosed by the clinical motor diagnosis is that it is late, late in the process, that different doctors make the diagnosis at different moments because the, the, it's subjective. And then people use these words, onset, disease onset, pre-manifest, manifest, for which there are no clear-cut definitions. And in, clinical, in, cl in the clinical, uh, uh, in, in a clinical practice, we might live with this uncertainty because it's a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. And we, like my colleague said before, it's a, in a dialogue a partnership, we can explain, we can listen what, what is, is understood, and we can, we can move on. But in clinical research, that's not possible. When you speak about the word pre-manifest and you are reading a paper, the use of that word should be exactly the same of in another paper written by other people. And if it is not, you got confused. How can I compare this data with that data if I don't know the definition? And there are no definitions. I, 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 can, I can go around the room, everybody will tell me a different thing. Similar things, but not exactly the same. So, for all these reasons, we, we, we needed to use other uh, methods. And uh, obviously, you probably know that the, to overcome, along the, the years, to overcome the, this, these difficulties, we have come up, uh, you know, the, the scientists have come up with some solutions. One of them, you, have, you already heard, is the CAP score, which uh, both the CAP score and the PIN score are mathematical formulas that we calculate with the, values that we obtain from rating scales or from information like the CAP score is based on the age 
and the size of the CAG. But do you know that there are at least 14 different ways of calculating the CAP score? And that if you don't look to the way how the CAP score was calculated, you cannot compare the CAP score of one paper to the CAP score of another paper. So that's one of the problems. And uh, we, we are also trying to sort this out. And uh, there has been new developments, and there is a, 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 cap, a, new, a new way of uh, uh, calculating the CAP score that is called CAP score 100. And uh, every statistician are now in agreement that this should be the way that uh, we should converge to um, a, the same way of calculating the CAP score. But do you think that anybody at a regulatory agency, either in Colombia or in Venezuela or in FDA in the United States, know what CAP score is? It's a very strange language. It's a mathematical formula. It's nice to know. It's nice to have in our research but is a poor instrument for communication. We cannot, if I, I, before I work in Huntington's disease, I used to work to Parkinson, in a Parkinson's disease. If I'm going to a Parkinson's disease congress, very likely a proportion of my colleagues don't have a clue of the, what CAP score is. So using these formulas is important in research. Is it, they are good tools but they are poor instruments for communication. And when we do research and when we do clinical trials, we do clinical trials to demonstrate the efficacy and safety of the new drugs, but just doing that is not enough. We need, we need to have them approved by the authorities. The regulators need to accept them and they need to give a license. And the agencies need to agree to pay for them whatever the type of agency that you have. So they need to have to understand the language. They need to be, we need to be understood in our arguments. <clears throat> so, so that's, all these are the reasons why having a, 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 a integrated staging system are so important for clinical research is, mo is mostly for, communica for communication and to allow for the harmonization of the data across studies. So uh, the title of this slide is uh, uh, who created the HDISS. I don't like the word created. Um, because it seems that we were inspired by God. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, it was a very detailed and thoughtful process. It was based on, on clinical evidence. It, it is an evidence-based process. But the context where we develop it was under the auspices of the Huntington, uh, Huntington's Disease uh, Regulatory Science Consortium that uh, was uh, established within an organization in the United States that is called the CPAS Institute. Who, uh, and FDA is a founding member of the CPAS Institute. So when we developed this, process, this uh, staging system, we had so-called informal feedback from FDA. You know that FDA is very, very careful what anything they say in public, and so they are very careful with the, their commitment to anything, but the fact is they participate in the meetings, they, they, review, they review the draft of the, the process, so FDA is, was inf an informal partner in the process. So, once again, we need to thank everybody that, uh, that participates in studies, in research, uh, even if that research is not yet with drugs, because this, dr this research that we call observational is foundational for everything that we can achieve after. And we, we are very grateful to all participants, not only in a role, but also in the, these other smaller studies, image, predict, and track, uh, all of this data was combined and used to, to, to develop the uh, staging system. 
So, oh, so first of all, the, within the context of the staging system, the definition of what is Huntington's disease is based on the genetic test. We get rid of this uncertainty. Are there clinical signs? Are not, there not clinical signs? So forth and so on. If a person is positive for the test, it, it, that, that person is classified as a, a person with Huntington's disease. The, the Huntington's disease staging system divides the process of the disease in four stages that cover the lifespan from, from birth to death. And uh, people in each of the stage have very clear uh, defined characteristics that I'm going to, to explain which they are. So, uh, as I said before, the most important reason why we need to use the Huntington's disease integrated staging system is to facilitate com communication and to have a standard that is common across geographies and uh, that uh, will allow for clinical trials in very early phases of the disease because we will be able to identify people and say these people are in, have the right characteristics to be in this early study. So, first of all, we didn't have sufficient data to include in the staging system the people with more than 50 CAGs and uh, hopefully with the studies like the one that Peg showed, the change HD that is going to generate data uh, um, on people with long CAGs, uh, we will cover for that uh, data in, uh, in the future. But for the moment, the, the staging system has been defined for between 40 and 50 CAGs. More than 50, we don't have enough data. Less than 40, we don't have enough data. But we know that people that are between 36 and 39, they have a reduced penetrance of the disease. And so we cannot define the disease just by the presence of a positive genetic test. We need to have something else. Uh, to classify that person as a person with HD. And uh, something else, we have some ideas about what those could be, but there are not enough data and we are collecting that data. And so that's another reason for people to be enrolled in a role and to give us more data for us to complement this. So the, the staging system is now for people with 40 or more CEGs, as I said, for people with 36 or more CEGs and less than 40, we will need what we call a disease-specific biomarker or a disease-specific clinical syndrome. And this is what we are trying to establish with more research. Uh, sorry. Uh, so this, this is new data that um, about the penetrance of uh, the different sizes of the CAGs and uh, um, uh, we, we can, you can see that, uh, for example, this is 38, the yellow, the, the penetrance during the estimated lifetime uh, of the disease which we use the, the um, uh, expectations of life in, new, in the United States which is 83 years, so you can see that all these, these curves don't get to under percent only after 40 they do. Okay, so to establish the staging system, we scan the literature, all data that has ever been published about Huntington's disease, and we showed that there is, the data showed that there is a, a pathway that is similar to other neurodegenerative diseases. And I must say that I concur with, with um, Ali and, and, and Peg 
that there is a component, a neurodevelopmental component of the disease that is not captured here because there is not enough data, but that's yet something that we'll have to, to um, consider in the future. But this, this pathway of different, <coughs> the, sorry, uh, oops. Uh, why this is skipping something, but, so this pathway of going from not having anything detectable by any of the current methods, uh, only the, the genetic test is positive, is stage zero. And then we get to stage one, which we have markers of neurodegeneration, but not yet, we cannot detect yet any clinical sign with the current uh, uh, rating scales. And then we have a stage two that is uh, when we are able to detect clinical signs with current uh, rating scales, which is very different from the concept of clinical motor diagnosis that was used or is used based on strict clinical judgment. And uh, stage three is when there is a functional decline in the, in the existing functional rating scales. This is very similar to this, the same process that happens with, with um, Alzheimer's disease, where stage one is the presence of biomarkers like amyloid or tau, stage two is uh, cognitive, uh, mild cognitive impairment, and stage three is dementia. So there is a clear and now analogy, and it applies also to other, uh, other neurodegenerative disease, although in Parkinson's disease, things are not yet so well established. Gosh. Okay, so we wanted to create a system that we could be valid in Latin America, in the United States, in Europe, in China, wherever. So we need to have clear cut landmarks that we can tell people that not what is your definition of pre-manifest or what is your ma uh, definition of manifest, but rather does your participant fulfill the conditions of this landmark or not? And so for to be on stage zero, the only condition is to have a CAG equal or higher than 40. To be on, uh, on stage one, which means that the neurodegenerative process started, our research of showed the best, the best measures to define that the neurodegeneration have started is the volume of the caudate or, and, or the putamen. For defining the presence of a clinical sign or symptom, Again, rating scales, based on rating scales, not on clinical impression, is the total motor score or a cognitive measure that is the symbol digit modality test. And, and for the functional decline, the, the choice end up on the independence scale and the total functional capacity scale. I know that you are going to tell me that there is an element of uh, uh, um, judgment, clinical judgment, that these scales are uh, rated. That's true, but they are more standardized than just a pure clinical impression. So, the other thing we did was to, de to define, based on data, what was the cutoff what was the value for these landmarks that put a person in that stage. And we use the same methodology that the World Health Organization uses to define the gross percentiles that everybody knows. Everybody that has a child 
knows that when they take their chil uh, their, their, uh, uh, the child to the, do to the doctor, uh, in the, um, they check if the weight of the child, let's say your child is six months, they check the weight or, and they will <coughs> check uh, the, um, uh, also the perimeter of the, the, um, of the head and they will check the, the height and then they will see if your child is developing according with the predicted or if they are out of range. So we use the same method to define what is out of range for the landmark. So if, if, um, if a child is uh, developing a, by this low line, is still within the normal, although it's a, uh, uh, it's a small child. But, but uh, if they are below, then there is a problem that we have to find out. So this is the five percent, uh, five, five percent percentile. And so we, what we did, we defined for the Caldate and Potain volume, the, for the total motor score and single digit, for the functional capacity, what is the 5% percentile of uh, the data that we had in controls. So to the, to the, we define what, was, what, are, what were the gross curves for controls, and then we decide what is below the 5% for controls, and that is the, the limit that defines that the person has crossed to the other stage. So this is the sequence of the stages, and this is what they mean. So stage zero, people have Huntington's disease, but they have no change in structure, no change in clinical symptoms, and then there is a, a progression. You might say, ha, huh, not everybody goes like that. The fact is, the large majority of uh, thousands of, of profiles that we analyzed, they progress l linearly through, uh, I'm not saying linearly in a mathematical way, but they progress sequentially. There is a minority that doesn't. It's about 12%, which is exactly the same percentage that was found in Alzheimer's for people that don't follow the sequence of the Alzheimer's uh, stages. So it's roughly the same number. So for the large majority, this is a sequential process. And, we, and if we have a person that is in stage two, we can assume they, they were in stage one and before they were in stage zero. It's a, it's a sequential process. <clears throat> okay, so these are questions that uh, uh, um, that, uh, that, is, that are important to be sorted out. So, because people that currently know they have uh, Huntington's disease or they, they have somebody in their family they, that has Huntington's disease, uh, they, they might want to know, um, how can I know my HDISS stage? Or do I need to know my HDISS stage? So, if that person is not thinking in participating in clinical research, they don't need to know the HDISS. The HDISS for the moment is for clinical research. So we don't need, nobody needs to be worried to know I'm stage one, I'm stage two, I'm whatever. Doesn't matter. But for people that want to participate in clinical research, they, there are two possibilities. Uh, one is, there are people that nowadays go to the internet and they look for studies to participate. They, they shop for a study. And might not be so common yet in Latin America, but in the United States, in Europe, is very common. People proactively look to studies where they can engage, where they can participate. And if, if one of you is like that, you need to know your stage. Because typically the studies advertise by saying, 
we are looking to enroll people in stage two or we are looking to enroll people in stage three. So the person that is willing to shop for studies needs to know. And so I must say, this is more or less like when you read the label of a drug and the drug says, if you overdose on this, call your doctor. And as a doctor, I have always been scared that anybody would call me about some drug that I never heard about. So, and they have uh, overdose on that, uh, on that drug. So this is a kind of a joke because what we are saying is, if you want to shop for a study, you ask your doctor what is your stage. And so for, for you, the doctors, to tell them what their stage is, what I can say is we have a calculator in the, in the website. You can input the numbers of the person and you'll get the response. At the moment, it's not yet very friendly. It's not very easy to use yet, but it will come soon. The other, the other way is your doctor tells you I, I'm doing this study and uh, I would like to invite you to come to, to this study and participate. And uh, for that, the doctor needs to calculate your HDISS stage. And now, there are two situations. Either you want to know, and uh, your doctor can say, yes, I'll calculate it, and if you want to know, yeah, here it is. Or you might say, I, 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 it's too much information, I don't want to know. And uh, okay, um, he, does, he does not need to tell you, but this is a bit uh, catch-22 situation, if you know what I mean. It's, uh, uh, you are caught for having a dog or, no, or, or, or for not having the dog. That's a Portuguese say, I don't know if it has translation. Uh, which means that if you accept to be in the study, and you, you have to, to, to sign the informed consent, etc., you are going to learn what are the conditions to be in the, state, in the state study, and therefore, even indirectly, you are going to learn your stage. <clears throat> That's what he's saying here. Okay. Once again, if you don't participate in clinical research, you don't need to know the stage, and there is no impact whatsoever in your routine clinical care. It's, it's irrelevant at the moment. If you want to participate, then at your request and with your consent, your doctor can tell you what your stage is. Another, another question that comes very frequently is, how to define stage one, we need to know the volume of the caudate or of the putamen, and for that end, we need to have an MRI. And to have an MRI and to calculate volumes is not trivial. And so what can I do? Uh, um, is the MRI really needed? So the MRI might not be needed. Usually, uh, does not, it's not absolutely necessary because we developed methods to deduce the, to deduce the size of the caudate and putamen using cl uh, mathematical models from the data that, uh, that has been obtained in the clinical phase of the disease. So we can infer the size of the caudate of the putamen. Of course, this only applies if the person is already in stage two or three. So, for people that are not yet there, the MRI will be needed. So, but for the time being, most of the clinical trials that have been done in the past, they have been done in stage three, and the trials that are currently planned, they are being planned in stage two. So for those trials, for the screening of patients to, let's say, to, to see if the patient might be a candidate, the MRI is not absolutely necessary. So that, uh, let's say, that makes things easier, at least in this phase. Going forward, and that's our desire, 
that in the future there will be trials in stage one, then we will need an MRI to do the screening. But, but until then, we can work with estimation. So, uh, the, the, the HDISS, as I already explained, does not change what we already knew about Huntington's disease. It might change what we will learn about HD in the future but it's not changing what we already knew. The, it, it changes the language. Like I said in the beginning, we are learning a new language. And in, in the past, people were convinced or they were under the impression that there was a magic moment, in this sense, not a good magic, but a magic moment where the disease appeared. Uh, at the moment where the clinical motor diagnosis was made. And uh, everybody now knows that that's not like that. And so that there are changes in the brain structure that are very slow, but that go on for long. And this is not new. The staging system didn't, didn't invent it. It only framed it in the proper place. So, I'm, I'm almost finishing. So, just to recap, the Huntington's disease staging system was developed using strict evidence-based methodology. We revised thousands of papers, and I believe I, I, one slide was kept uh, uh, I skip one slide with this small uh, this thing because the, we had a funnel showing how many papers were reviewed, how many landmarks were uh, extracted. There were thousands of, of um, I, I can try just quickly if the oh, I, okay, here it is. So, we review all the literature and uh, we extract potential landmarks. The total was 2,790. And then we only select uh, landmarks that have been studied in, in, in uh, cohorts that were large cohorts and for which there was longitudinal, longitudinal data. So, it's a much smaller number, 371. Then we selected unique landmarks because uh, many times there was repeated measures, uh, things that were the same. We end up with 176. Then we select the ones that had prognostic value in mathematical models, at least two independent models, or one model that used two diff different cohorts, and there was 27. And from these 27, we select those that were, that are, that was the strongest evidence. It was 16. And it was from the 16 that we'll end up with eight. So th this was the process. It was a lengthy, but well, uh, uh, scientific based process to do all this. Sorry for going, trying to go in really quick. Okay. So. So this is the final, almost uh, final slide. So we developed the, and the staging system based on strict evidence-based process. It allows uh, uh, accurate determination of uh, the status of the disease at any age. It's not dependent on, on CAP score. So you, you, you use these landmarks they occur early in people with higher, uh, higher CGs, but the, the sequence is the same. As I said in the beginning, the main uh, uh, value of the staging system is to facilitate communication and to allow for the selection of people that participate in the research and to allow for the comparison of studies across different studies done by different scientists in different places of the world, we will be able to compare them and bring them together. And importantly, 
for communication. We'll be able to communicate with FDA, with MEA, with the regulatory agencies in Latin America and so forth. So, and finally, but not the least, it will allow us for selecting very early participants in trials in stage one or even in stage zero when there will be technologies and might not be only drugs, it can be devices, it can be other types of intervention in very early phases of the disease. So, <clears throat> once again, I, we have to thank the contribution of the participants, of the families. This has been the most valuable co uh, contribution that allow not just the development of the staging system, but all the research that goes around it. And there is not enough words to thank this, this contribution. It's, it, and we hope that with our work, we return it to the community, that the community benefits from the recycling of the information. So these are the authors of, the, of, the, um, of this, this uh, work. And of course, there was a, a lot of people within CHDI that helped the, the process. And of course, I'm not sure how long it took, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions in Spanish or English. Thank you very much, Cristina. It was great. Thank you. Very long. You're okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I think we have time for two half questions. Um, wonderful presentations. Thank you, Christina and the Enroll HD Dean for, for this amazing work. And uh, you mentioned that at this stage, so the system is only um, useful for under research arena, right? But the idea is in the future to be used for uh, on clinical practice as well, and probably uh, there uh, we have to consider its other aspects before we can translate that for clinical practice. Is that possible for you to anticipate what are the potential problems to make this translation, for example? And my second brief question is regarding how can we prevent disparities, for example, in regions like Latin America when we have done up available for clinical practice and, for example, regions where would not be possible to perform all the requirements yeah. to categorize patients? Now, obviously very good questions and there are only partial answers. Uh, usually, a staging system, when it translated from research to clinical practice, is simplified. It's what is happening with Alzheimer's. The ATN system started to be strictly for research. Now, with the, uh, uh, with the ability we do, uh, of doing uh, amyloid test in blood, uh, it, it was a big push to make it, uh, uh, let's say, valuable in the, in the clinical practice. But it, it took many, many years, a decade or more, since, since it started to be spoken about in the context of research up to the moment that started to be applied in clinical practice, I mean Alzheimer's. So taking this by analogy, I would say very likely it will happen, happen the same with the, uh, the Huntington staging system. There will be more and more studies that use it. At this very moment, almost any company that is planning a, a, a trial is using the staging system. I mean, this month or last month. So the next generation of trials have, will have used the, the staging system. Hopefully, one drag out of those trials will be approved and then you will have a drug that has been approved for the use of uh, in stage two or in stage three. And then this will transpire for clinical practice because you have to, to um, de determine who is in that stage to give them the drug. So it's a slow process and it's a bit interactive. Uh, regarding uh, this inequalities and disparities, all of, of course, we have all to give our small contribution to um, to um, so solve part of the problem. It will not be solved just by a magic wand. Uh, we'll have to, to, to make it happen. I, I recently learned about a, 
um, a say attributed to Desmond Tutu that uh, I think it's uh, relatively well known. That is the question, how do you, how do you eat an elephant? And Desmond Tutu answer, bite by bite. So I think the inequalities of the world, which you have in Latin America, but we also have in Europe, and we, in the United States is huge. I think it will, buy, it will be a bite by bite, small step by small step, and we'll get there. Thank you very much. And of course, as always, uh, if, you, if you have any other questions, just please feel free to approach Christina any other time. Um, Thank you.